Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in Luke chapter 9, and we resume our study in verse 56. So get your Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 9. We'll begin in just one minute after I remind you, as I do on every broadcast, that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is available for you. You can study the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. Just click and listen at your pace, at your convenience. Three complete series going through the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse. Study them in order or any way you want to. The important thing is that you're in the Word of God. <clears throat> and that's what we're doing again today, of course. That's what this ministry has been about for over 30 years. That's all I have ever done. And that's all I ever will do with regards to the Word of God is teach it verse by verse from beginning to end. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is on his way to Judah, southern part of Israel, where Jerusalem is. He sent a couple of apostles ahead of him because he was up north in Galilee. And they went down to Samaria, that middle section of the land of Israel, filled with Samaritans, half-breeds, spiritually half-breeds, physically hated by the Jews because of that. And they hated the Jews right back. And when they found out that Jesus was coming through, they did not receive him. They did not want to talk to him. They didn't want anything to do with him because he was headed for Jerusalem, and they didn't like that. So John had a brilliant idea, John the Apostle. He says, should we call fire down from heaven and fry them, incinerate them? Because they said that about you, they didn't want you, and Jesus said no. And he tells us in verse 56 why. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So the Samaritans rejected Jesus Christ, hands down, no bones about it, didn't want anything to do with him. And Jesus said, let's move on to a different place. And he left it at that. He said, I didn't come to destroy lives. I didn't come to kill people. I came to save that was his mission, first time here, to save, not to kill. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. It's not the day of God's wrath. Oh, there's wrath included in sin. And that's because sin is unnatural. Sin comes fully loaded with its own trouble. But God is not up in heaven firing lightning bolts down on sinners. That day will come, but it's not today. Today is the day of salvation. And Christians are supposed to be instruments of God's grace, not God's wrath. If someone rejects you because they reject the word of God and reject Jesus, just leave them be and move on to somebody else. Warn them that their decision has eternal consequences. But it's not your job to call fire down from heaven and destroy them. And I know sometimes you feel like it, right? Verse 57. And it came to pass that, as they went on the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever thou goest. Sounds great, doesn't it? Many would hear a strong, positive statement like that. And they would automatically believe him. Not only would they believe him, many people would count on him to do what he said. Jesus was not that naive. 58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus wants to make absolutely certain 
that this guy who made this bold statement, unconditional, I'll follow you wherever you go, period, you got it. Count on me. Well, Jesus wants to make sure that this man knows the truth and that he doesn't have an ide idealistic view of what it means to follow Christ. He says, following me is going to get you into trouble. It's not going to be pleasant to follow me. Following me means you're going to be uncomfortable sometimes. Jesus is asking the man if he's willing to put up with the difficulties because of his connection to Christ, because he may have to do that. In fact, it's more than may. He will in one form or another. And according to Jesus, Christians must live with the attitude that following him and living for him and speaking the pure truth of God's word without watering it down is worth more than anything, worth more than any comfort, any entertainment, any security, and any sin that the world may offer. If you don't have that attitude, just don't even start because you're not serious and you'll never finish. Jesus always was up front. He never sold an easy believism. He never made it seem easy to follow him. Just the opposite. Worst case scenario. 59. And you know why he did that? Because then the Holy Spirit would weed out people who were not really serious. Because eventually they'd walk anyway when the trouble came. That's why I believe in being straightforward about the Word of God. I've had people say, why, why don't you just water down the Word? Why, why, are you so, why are you such a straight shooter? Why don't you just, you know, be a little more lukewarm in what you teach? Be a little more vague so you don't turn anybody off. Well, what are you waiting for, man? If, the, if somebody is not given the Word of God clearly enough to anger those who aren't interested and make those who aren't interested walk away, then it's not going to be clear enough to bless anybody who is interested. I'm not interested in placating the lukewarm or making the unsaved who don't want to be saved and don't want to repent feel comfortable. That's not my business. They can turn on cable television for that. I'm here to give out the truth. That's what Jesus did. And boy, he weeded out the half-hearted before they even got started. Might as well. Because all they're going to do is cause trouble, trouble for you a little later anyway. Verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. And believe me, his father's corpse was not at home rotting and waiting to be buried. He never would have been out in this crowd if his dad was home dead because they buried somebody usually the same day. His father wasn't dead yet. What the man was saying is, sure, Jesus, I will follow you a little later. He's saying, I'll follow you someday, after my father dies, whenever that might be. Someday, I will do what you want me to do. Someday, I will submit to the truth. Someday. Jesus isn't interested in someday. And someday never comes. You either do it now or you don't do it at all. You're either ready now or you'll never be ready. Verse 60, Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So the command to this man was, follow Christ right now. Right now. You have an opportunity to follow me now. I'm calling you now. You better take advantage of it. Yes, but first was the wrong response from this man. Either we want to follow Christ or we don't. 
But to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, we must want to do it unconditionally. There is no other follower of Christ. You either unconditionally follow him or you don't follow him. It's black and white. The Son of God demands complete loyalty starting right now, right this second. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, give out the truth a little later. I've been told by modern evangelicals, Mike, this back when I, when I used to pastor a church, Mike, just, again, water down the word of God. Don't give it so straight. Let them start coming. After they come a while, then you can give them the truth. You know, I've talked about this before. I said, what do I, why would I do that? Why would I misrepresent the word of God and Jesus Christ to get somebody to come to my church only to have them leave later on if I suddenly had the guts to tell them the truth? Well, that's not me. <clears throat> Stupid. No, nowhere in the Bible does God ever say, hey, preachers, Bible teachers, tell the truth later on? Not right now. Tell the truth later on. Teach the Word of God a little later. Hold back the truth now and tell it the way it is a little later. God never tells us to do that. Proclaim the truth. Today is a day of salvation. Teach, rebuke, correct, train in righteousness using the word of God. That's the divine mandate. And nowhere does God say a little later. He never says, hold back truth now. Tell the truth a little later. He never tells us to, to accept the truth when we get a chance. He never says, accept the truth of God's word when you feel like it. Probably a little later. With God, the time to do the correct thing is right now. I'll never, and this is so typical. This is so typical. Typical of modern evangelicalism. There was a man, and I'm not going to give the name. He was speaking at a conference, a well-known, used to be fundamental, solid Bible college and seminary. It's gone modern evangelical in recent years. But one of their big Bible conferences, so-called, one of the speakers got up and told the student body, you need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior right now. Don't worry about receiving him as Lord. Most people don't do that until they're in their 30s. Don't worry about that. But receive him as Savior. You know, that apostate, that dirty, rotten, filthy, false teacher, that liar, possibly condemned, hundreds of young people to hell by saying that. By giving them false security. So you can have Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, maybe, maybe in your 30s, maybe you're close to 40, then you get serious about it, make him Lord. You can't have Jesus as your Savior unless you make him your Lord. And Jesus never says, give them the truth now. Make a commitment to follow me later. These people he's talking to right now, they needed to make a commitment to him right now, to follow him right now. Not when you get in your 30s. Not 20 years from now. Don't worry about it. Do it. Follow me 20 years from now. And you'll be just fine. You see how stupid that is? Do you see how corrupt so much of modern evangelicalism has become? Do you see that? For the life of me, 
Don't these people ever pick up the Word of God and read it and take it at face value? They must not. They, they can't be doing that. Or they wouldn't say such ridiculous things, unbiblical things. I'm not a scholar, but I'm smart enough to read the Bible verse by verse and teach it verse by verse and not say something the opposite of what it teaches. I tell you, sometimes I feel like a genius. <laughs> and if you knew me, you knew I wasn't. You knew I was being sarcastic. It's never follow me later. Preach the truth later. Make a commitment to me later. You either do it now or you're not doing it. You may be dead five minutes from now. And so he says, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. When? Now. Let your unsaved family members bury your pa when he dies. I've called you to do something. And I'm God and you better do it. And don't put it off. Because that's the same as disobedience, my friends. 60, 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell who are at home at my house. Well, Christ cannot hang around and wait for this man to go home and straighten things out before he follows him, which is what he wanted Jesus to do. Again, the call is to follow Jesus immediately. Put Jesus before your family. Put Jesus before your business. Put Jesus before the things that this world thinks are so important and so essential, and they'll scratch their head and they'll think you're crazy. They'll think you've gone off the deep end. Well, if that's going to bother you enough to, to keep you from following Jesus right now, then you better not die. You better hope you don't die because you're going to die and you're going to go straight to hell. The call, the command, repent and follow Jesus right now. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find his life. Christ cannot hang around and will not hang around and wait for this man to go home and straighten things out before he follows him. This man wanted to do God's will, but he wanted to do it on his schedule, not God's. That's such a good trick of the devil. Satan's not an idiot. He's not stupid. He's smart. He knows what will work. He doesn't tell people, don't you ever do the correct thing. Never do the correct thing. You know what the correct thing is. You know what the Bible says. Don't you ever do that. Make a commitment right now to never do the correct thing. He doesn't tell people that. It works much better when he says, do it later. And then he'll keep you occupied with one thing or another until you die and you go to hell. He doesn't tell preachers. That's why you never hear a preacher say, even a modern evangelical say, I'm never going to give out the truth. Oh, some do. But most say, I'm never going to give out the truth. They don't say that. I'll do it later. Later never comes. 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is saying, Don't put off getting saved. Don't put off following him. If the Christ rejecter dies today and God says, why did you not receive my son? It will do no good for that person to say, well, I was planning on it, but there were a few other things that I wanted to do first. You know how it goes. Busy, busy, busy. 
I was planning on it. Well, that's not going to do you any good. The game is over. The second you die. No overtime. There's a reason God says today is the day of salvation. And it includes the fact that no one is guaranteed a tomorrow. Repenting and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior should be top priority for everyone right now, this second, the moment you hear the gospel, the moment you hear the word of God. Because until that is taken care of, nothing else matters much. Because if you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. And you are never getting out. Chapter 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So he sent them out ahead of time and to prepare the way. And notice verse 2, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That is a prayer request from Jesus. You don't get many of them. It's a prayer request. Jesus, I have a prayer request for you. Pray to the Father that he will raise up preachers who will boldly proclaim the word of Almighty God. And that is a prayer that we should pray every day. It's a prayer that I pray every day. Every day I say, Father, Jesus asked me to pray that you would send out laborers who will boldly proclaim the word of God. So I pray for that right now. And I also ask that I could be one of them. I pray that prayer every single morning. As far as I remember, that's Jesus' only prayer request that he ever asked us to pray for, specifically. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. There is never a recession or a depression in the kingdom of God. There's always plenty of work to do. Unemployment rate in the kingdom of God is zero. For anybody who wants to work, there's plenty of work. There's more work that needs to be done than Christians who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get to work. The harvest is plentiful. There's a lot to do. But the laborers are few. Most people who call themselves Christians are too busy doing other things than to serve Jesus Christ the way he wants them to and to use the gifts that God has given them. Verse 3, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And that doesn't sound too good, does it? But this goes along with what he was talking about earlier in the last chapter. If you think living for Jesus and speaking the truth of God's word is going to mean fun and games for you in this life, in this world that hates truth and loves sin, you got another thing coming. Boy, have you been handed a line and a lie. Jesus never said that. He said, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Those of you who speak the truth of God's word without watering it down. Those of you who live a holy life, those of you who proclaim Jesus is the only way to heaven, the things that the Bible says, those of you who live the way God wants you to live in Jesus' name, you're going to be ripped to pieces. You're going to be torn to shreds. Don't be surprised when you get opposition from the unsaved, when people treat you unfairly, when people talk behind your back, when people persecute you, and believe me, mister, it's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. As the end draws near, you can already see it. The pressure is being applied. And someplace, more Christians have been killed 
in recent years than in many years in different parts of this world. You're among wolves. You know what a pack of wolves would do to a sheep? Rip it to shreds. Don't expect to be welcomed by those wolves when you're one of Jesus' sheep. Don't be shocked when bad happens to you. Expect it. I said it last time, I think. Expect it and accept it. God warned you ahead of time. Not a pretty picture. It's reality. Four, carry neither purse nor bag nor shoes and greet no man by the way. This is too urgent for these guys. It's speaking specifically to the 70 that he's sending out on this mission. Get out the word of God. Tell them about me. We got to spread the word. The word of God and the word about me. Tell people to repent. Tell them it's time for salvation. Tell them it's time to avoid hell. And you got to do it urgently. No time to prepare. Just go. Say, what are they going to do for sustenance? How are they going to keep going? Not a problem. Look at verse 5. And into whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. So, you go to a house. You go to an area, you talk to a group of people or a person, and you give them the truth of God's word. You tell them about Jesus. You tell them the truth about the word of God, that unpopular message in this world today that rubs people the wrong way because it goes against the prevailing attitudes in the world today. You give them the truth. You offer them peace with God. If they will only repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's the only way you offer them peace. And you do that first. Got some good news for you. If you repent, you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. You do that first, verse 6. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall return to you again. You don't water down the message. You tell them the truth. You give them the ultimatum, the good news, the one way to heaven, the narrow way, follow Jesus Christ, repent, receive him as Lord and Savior, follow him, die to self, take up your cross, be willing to follow him, be willing to suffer and sacrifice to follow Jesus. You tell them that truth because that's the truth that Jesus was talking about earlier. That's the message. If they accept it, that's great. Everything's fine. When you leave, you say you're in good shape. Keep it up. You're off to a great start. But, verse 7, <clears throat> and in, yeah, well, let's read 6 and 7. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall return to you again. You walk away. And you don't bid them God's speed. Well, I'm sorry to hear you're rejecting Jesus Christ. Good luck anyway. No, you don't say that. You leave. Seven. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So Jesus is saying when you're out there and somebody gives you an offering, somebody says, come on over, I'll feed you, I'll give you a place to sleep. Because they didn't have time to re prepare, Remember? They're just out there on their own. Jesus says, you accept the first offer. From somebody who accepts the word, you accept their first offer. And don't you go switching from house to house depending on what they have for on their menu or what kind of bed they give you to sleep. And I, Jesus, does, Jesus does not want his ministers to give the idea that they're in the ministry as a career. And I got to stop. We'll, we'll touch on this again next time. I'm way out of time. Continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. If you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me. Pray for the Word of God. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Don't forget, join me. Don't miss it. We'll pick it up right where we left off.
Until next time, so long.